Dave Hill. He was my house tutor when I was a freshman. He came here as an undergraduate in 1964. Correct. Uh, he was president of his fraternity. And the next year, he was a house tutor. Back in those days, the dean's office had a tutor in every fraternity. And then they cut the budgets. And after a while, they had almost no house tutors. Okay? Until this guy in the early 2000s drank himself to death in the first in October. And they decided, oh, we should have a house tutor program. But Dave was the, the house tutor that first year that he graduated as a graduate student. And the next year, he was in charge of all the house tutors. He's a very capable person. He became a vice president at Honeywell, a Fortune 50 company, before he's 40 years old. He's been CEO of two large chemical companies. Uh, he's retired now, but he spent the last 10 years sitting on boards of companies and acting as a consultant. Uh, he's very outspoken, not quite as outspoken as me, because he's a little bit more tactful most of the time. But he will tell you the truth about things, and that's what, we just had that discussion, right? And that discussion I just had with you is what I'd like today to be, but I want you to hear it from someone else. So it's not just me who doesn't believe in all these things. But I'm gonna, I was just putting up a list. We got additive manufacturing. These are great expectations that everybody says they're going to change the world, right? Is that true or not? They're going to change part of the world. And what you read in the papers is overselling, okay? And you need to think critically about things, okay? Dave wanted me to show you, remind the students who weren't here yesterday of some of the principles. Yeah, just a few of the high points. Uh, for structural materials, the two types of materials. <clears throat> this was the second slide. Structural materials used in extremely large volumes billions of tons a year. Functional materials like semiconductors or optical fibers or whatever used in much smaller volumes. Functional materials could have values of millions of dollars a pound, like silicon, okay? Structural materials, they have to be cheap, okay? And so we went through and we talked about the cost of a material uh, here are the billion tons per year club, stone, concrete, engineering, wood, and steel if you're talking structural materials. If you're talking about the cost of a material, we went through, there's a slide, there's a slide, there's some best. Here it is. The value of a structural material pound saved over the life of the vehicle a ship or a railroad, 20 cents a pound. Autos, $2 a pound. Aircraft, $200 a pound. To get a pound in orbit, $20,000 a pound. When people talk about additive manufacturing, usually they're coming up with examples from these latter two because additive manufacturing is expensive. You're not going to put it in, you're not going to build ships or automobiles. Okay? Are those the high points you wanted, or do you have some others? No, that's good. Okay, so why don't you... <clears throat> so can we, go, can we go back to the first slide that you had, which was, how, how, do we, how do we get to venture capital? Oh, that was actually the last slide. <laughs> All right, the last slide. Oops. Okay, oops. Okay, so uh, when I graduated from MIT in 1968, well, that was my undergraduate graduation, my bachelor's degree, the world was a very different place than it is today. Uh, we were at the height of a Cold War. Uh, the government had been for many years extremely interested in investing in advanced materials uh, and pursuing a, a degree in sophisticated material science opened up a lot of opportunities. The world's changed significantly since then. Places like Bell Laboratories, which really housed some of the most brilliant minds, I think, in science in the 1960s, disappeared with the breakup of AT&T back in 1970. Um, IBM 
once a, a tremendous leader in science, and particularly uh, a company that was focused on using superconductivity to revolutionize the world of computation, the super, superconducting computer. IBM is just a shadow of its former self and not so much materials focused anymore. So as time has evolved, the question becomes, where does the funding come from? Who supports new science? And since about 2000, it's been largely uh, venture capital money. People who have a lot of money, don't know what to do with it, uh, and invest. Now, do they invest wisely or not so wisely? Uh, one of the VC firms I've worked with in the past pursued what they call the spray and pray approach to venture capital. Spread it all out there, throw it over here, throw it over there, and pray for the best result. Serendipitously, sometimes that works. Most often it doesn't work. So we see today an interest in private money supporting research because someone is looking for uh, the, the magic stone, the elixir that's going to create a world, a world beating new technology in material science. The problem with that, as Tom points out, is um, anything that has the possibility of being different and can be promoted as being different from some thread of scientific principle becomes uh, a cause celebre and a, and a focus. And uh, Tom's listed a couple of things up here that uh, I think he's spoken to you about in the past, uh, about great expectations. Uh, one of the ones that I've been involved with quite recently uh, at a fairly high level is graphene, which I guess is uh, up here. It's a, the current manifestation of the fact that people who don't know anything have finally discovered that carbon-carbon bond is really as strong as the carbon-carbon bond is. Uh, and there's still a significant amount of interest in pursuing uh, graphene opportunities. Um, Rice University and University of Texas at Austin are probably the two largest focus for technical efforts in the field today in the U.S. Uh, and uh, in Britain, it's Manchester University. And that's where you go if you want to see who's, who's got the most current view of graphene. Problem with graphene is it's a solution looking for a problem. You can speculate, anyone can speculate, on what it might be able to do. Number one, it's difficult to produce. Number two, it's difficult to stabilize because these little carbon sheets that are atomic size, barely, uh, they have a lot of uh, surface energy and they, they don't want to be just little specks of carbon, two-dimensional carbon floating in some medium. So people have to stabilize them somehow. And the challenge becomes how do you stabilize them and how do you stabilize them in a way in which they're amenable to processing? Because it's okay to have something that's an intellectual curiosity and submicron in size carbon sheets. Well, how do I actually fabricate it? What do I actually do with it? Um, I, I can... I can think of things I could do with it if I could only somehow process it. So I'm not sure what experience you had, Tom, with the graphene. None. None? <laughs> you stayed away from it? I stay away from the, the uh, great expectation that there is. So um, stories. Tom likes to tell stories. Um, I've worked on a lot of technologies in, in my years, um, some of them sublime and some of them ridiculous. Um, one I did work on uh, was amorphous metals. Amorphous metals were a very big cause celebre in the 1980-1990 range. <clears throat> um, it, it's an interesting concept. Um, as I'm sure mo most of you know, metals form crystalline structures when they solidify. Uh, and the driving force for that, those crystal structures, is thermodynamically very large. The only way that you can create a, a metallic structure that doesn't have long-range order, that isn't crystalline, 
is to freeze it very quickly. So in the, uh, in the 70s, in the early 70s, here, uh, Nick Grant and others were, were looking at splat cooling of metals. Uh, and the way they did that was to levitate a drop of metal. Uh, so you need a magnetic field to levitate it. So we focus basically on iron as your primary uh, component. And then blast it with a jet of air or a jet of nitrogen and smash it up against a really cold surface. Splat cooling was what the people called it. And with that, you could make structures that were amorphous. They were metals, but they didn't have long range order. They weren't crystalline. And people started playing around looking at some of the, of the interesting properties that these materials might have. Um, probably the most interesting property of these amorphous metals is the fact they have no grain boundaries. And the lack of grain boundaries is very important when you think about things like putting a material in a magnet uh, and subjecting the magnet to alternating field. In other words, like a transformer. So if I have a transformer and I, it's an alternating current transformer and I need to reverse the field 60 times a second, I'm going to discover that the magnetic lines of flux experience hysteresis when they're dragged through the grain boundary. The grain boundary holds them up. If I eliminate the grain boundary, I eliminate the hysteresis loss. So people theorize that they could make very highly efficient transformers using amorphous metals. The problem is you couldn't make amorphous metal transformers. You couldn't make cores or anything of any substance from a splat-cooled metal. All you had was a metal splat. You can think of it as a pigeon dropping. <laughs> At least that's the way I used to think about it. So certain advances in science had to be made in order to turn this, what was then an intellectual curiosity, into something that had the potential for commercial success. Uh, the first was you needed a composition of matter that was more tractable and easier to freeze as an amorphous metal than was currently then known. And the second challenge you had to overcome is you needed a way to make it economically. And I think Tom's earlier slide here about uh, the cost per pound of making materials is a very important, uh, very important thought you have to carry around whenever you're thinking about uh, a new material and a new, a new material and an application. The economics have to be there to make it work. So someone had to figure out how to create amorphous metals in a form that uh, was low cost. Uh, and the, the fellow who did this was a really bright guy. He, he basically said, if I could take the splat metal, that little nodule that was floating in space, magnetically levitated, if I could somehow stabilize it, and if I could somehow pull it away fast enough by, by winding it up, I could make amorphous metal in a, in a sheet or a ribbon. And what he did was to basically propose the concept of using uh, two surfaces very close to each other, one very cold, very refrigerated, another with a nozzle of the small slit, and, and making what amounted to a sessile drop supported by these two surfaces on a wheel and rip this stuff off and wind it up. And long story short, 10 years and $100 million later, people figured out how to do that. The problem is that um, steel that's used for transformer applications is cheap. Um, if you look at Tom's slide, steel is one of the cheapest materials up there. So even though there was a new material that had lower hysteresis losses, was it economical enough to pass the test of being a substitute for what was then silicon iron? That's what was used in the cores of transformers. And the answer is, well, marginally. And today the business is about $250 million in total revenue. Uh, it's almost all focused on making transformers for countries where the cost of energy is very high. So the Japanese uh, eventually bought up the technology from the people who had the capability around the world. And they're making the material and making it be successful. But I think from my own experience, um, working through 
the issues from a technical perspective of how to create the glassy structure and do it in a way that was at least economically competitive or potentially competitive in the in the realm of understanding what the overall economics for the use of the material was it was a very was a very important thought process so when Tom talks about his list of great expectations one of the things that people often lose sight of in their enthusiasm and their rush to uh, uh, anoint a new technology as the savior for all of our problems is understanding what the overall economics are to make it, to fabricate it, and then to actually use it and achieve whatever benefit is, is proposed to be associated with it. Okay, uh, let me just say a couple of things about what Dave just said. He was in charge with Honeywell for building, actually it was Signal at the time, the first honey production plant for amorphous metal sheets. Okay? And it's down in South Carolina. Conway, South Carolina. Conway, South Carolina, which is near Myrtle Beach. Okay? Um, and the Japanese built the plant, and he could tell you stories about all the intellectual property problems of dealing with the Japanese when you're using intellectual property. He could tell you a story about how uh, Allied Signal sent a sample of their little laboratory material before they started building a tonnage plant to a guy named Professor Chad Graham at the University of Pennsylvania. You want to tell him that story? You tell him. Okay, well, Professor Graham was an expert at measuring magnetic properties. Allied Signal in their research lab didn't have the equipment to measure the magnetic susceptibility of of uh, samples. So they were just down the street in New Jersey from Philadelphia, and so they asked Professor Graham, well, you got the equipment, can you measure this? He said, sure. So he measured it, found out it had 10 times the hysteresis, 10 times less hysteresis loss than the silicon iron that Allegheny Ludlum Steel was producing. And that, by the way, Allegheny Ludlum Steel at the time was essentially owned by a guy named Dick Simmons. You've heard of Simmons Hall, okay? Dick Simmons was a graduate of this department. Barely got through here with his bachelor's degree. I won't tell you that story. But he did graduate, and he became the owner of, in the 1980s of Allegheny Ludlum Steel. So the problem that Alex Signal had is they hadn't signed a non-disclosure agreement with Chad Graham and so it turns out the University of Pennsylvania and Chad Graham owned the intellectual property rights to the low magnetic properties, lost properties, of the amorphous metal. And that created a huge problem. And because of that faux pas, there's virtually no one in industry today that doesn't make you sign an intellectual property agreement to talk about what they're doing. Okay? That was a hundreds of millions of dollars loss to the company that had developed it because they didn't think about the intellectual property aspects. Okay? So is that fair? We have some more to that story? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's just fortunately it wasn't me who was sharing, steering the ship at that point. <laughs> I got on board later. Okay. But um, so the amorphous metals have tremendously low losses 10 times better, and if you did the economics at that time, they were going to be all over the United States. General Electric was going to start changing all the transformers in, on the streets. You know, you hear them humming in the summer because the, the, the steel plates are vibrating. Except, did you know that Allegheny Ludlum and Arco and a few other steel companies that made silk and iron, and that was a billion dollar business, they decided they didn't want to lose it? So they went back to the laboratory and they started improving their product. And all of a sudden the amorphous metals, which didn't have a whole lot of room to get better, because they had no grain boundaries, it turns out the others caught up with them to the point where it's just nip and tuck. Okay? But if you did the economics when they first discovered the magnetic properties, you would have said silicon iron is dead. But that's, that's an important lesson I've seen over and over. You can't assume that the competitor is going to remain static. People who have billion dollar businesses are not willing to let them go. 
They might not do anything for them when they're fat, dumb, and happy. But when they see the competition coming, they start to think. Okay? Uh, for example, I like to give these, the, I like to state the, the fact that the most, the, the average productivity gain across all of U.S. manufacturing in the 1980s was 1% growth. In the service sector, it was actually negative because we started using PCs. And it actually lowered the productivity. Those old PCs were just a time waste to, to use. Okay? Now, they've gotten better, and so they've kind of gotten over that hump. But initially, they reduced the productivity. There was one industry that had a 6% productivity gain per year in the 1980s. Guess what industry it was? The steel industry. Because they were being, the American steel industry was, they're being... Uh, decimated. Decimated, yeah. <laughs> they, they were losing money, but they were going to die unless they innovated. And it turns out they went from, they had constant production roughly of 100 million tons a year for that decade. They went from half a million employees to 250,000 employees. Guess what that is over 10 years? That's a doubling of productivity. Okay? They didn't stay static. And it turns out the mini mills over that period are now the most productive steel companies in the world. The American steel industry is the most productive. They still trade at a discount because Wall Street still thinks of them as a dog. And to a certain extent, they are dogs. Except you don't say that to Mattel. Anybody know who Mattel is? Who's Mattel? Right. He's an Indian who was smart enough to know that steel is a big business, and if all these other people want to get rid of it, he'll take it at 10 cents on the dollar, or a penny on the dollar. Okay? And now he's a very wealthy man, and he owns one of the largest steel companies in the world. Okay? So there are some people who actually understand the technology. And by the way, that guy Dick Simmons, for which Simmons Hall is named, the American steel industry is losing the shirts in the 1980s. Allegheny Ludlam, run by Dick Simmons, never had an unprofitable quarter in the 1980s. Why? Their CEO understood the business. Not just from a business point of view. He knew how to make steel. And I've been to the plant. They've been, they had some failures and I had to go to the plant. In general, the steel workers and the management hate each other. But you go to Allegheny, you love them. And they hate most of the management, <laughs> but they love Dick Simmons. Okay? He's a hero. He saved their jobs and they know it. Okay? Okay, questions? You want to talk about additive manufacturing? And Dave's opinion on that? You want to talk about VCs? Why are the VCs around here? He told you a little bit, but we haven't told you the real story. So I've been working with uh, VCs and private equity groups quite a bit over the last 10 years. Uh, and it's kind of been a very interesting experience. Um, normally I wind up uh, in the conversation when there's something wrong. <laughs> no one asks me at the beginning how to do it right. They just ask me when something's wrong, can I come and fix it? Um, and I think today, uh, the, the, the private investment in commercializing technology is going to continue. I think that the blush is off the rose for materials. I don't think we're going to see a continued uh, focus of investment in the materials area because it's just becoming more and more difficult to express and create the value equations that we've talked about earlier that satisfy people that they're going to get their 20% return on their investment in three to five years. Any technology that requires physical assets to produce, like mills, uh, big chemical complexes, the life, the, the life cycle, the, the cycle lifetime in order to get from start to finish isn't three to five years. It's more like 10 years. 
And the patience of VC investors is not, that is not long enough for that. So we're seeing less and less investment in the material space by VCs today. Basically what we're seeing is a lot of investment by private equity groups who want to buy up assets that are not being used effectively and consolidate them and squeeze out savings by just being more efficient in the way the business is run. So I'm, you know, one more story about materials. Um, most of my time right now is spent uh, with carbon fiber reinforced plastics, uh, which is kind of a really interesting uh, snapshot into the value-added side of Tom's, Tom's slide. 50% um, of the weight of a Dreamliner 787 is some form of composite material. You know, it's kind of interesting to realize that you're flying on a plastic plane. Most people think about plastics as being um, not very durable, not highly structural. But when you fly on a, a, an A350, uh, an Airbus A350 or a Boeing 787, you're flying on a, on a vessel that is 50% by weight composite materials. Uh, and composite materials have some attributes. They're lightweight. Their strength to weight ratio is very good. It happens to be unidirectional unless you do something to obviate the unidirectionality because it's made by fibers in a matrix. And the way I have to get around that and make it more isotropic is to lay my, fabric, my fibers up in different patterns so that I get more isotropic behavior. Um, plastic matrix is you, the, the plastic matrix that's used is an epoxy. Uh, it's a thermoset. So when you're processing materials that are thermosets, you better not make a mistake because what you wind up with is a lot of very expensive scrap. You can't reprocess a thermoset. The challenges that the industry face today in aerospace, commercial aerospace, are largely overcome. And there probably won't be that much new growth uh, in this industry because the penetration rates are uh, achieving a plateau, unless something fundamentally changes. Now, what, what, what would drive fundamental change? What would I, if I have a composite material today and its cost is X, what would I think about doing in order to lower the cost of making that material? Anybody got any ideas? Well, the first thing you need to look at is raw material costs. Today, most of the carbon fiber that's used in high performance structures comes from acrylonitrile. Uh, and acrylonitrile is a, it, it's a polymer. Um, it's not a very effective polymer for the production of fiber because when I create the fiber, I have to, actually have to burn off uh, most of the, of, the, of the chlorine and, and other things that, uh, that uh, are part of the polymer but not necessarily ne integral to creating that carbon structure in the fiber. And this is back to Tom's story about the strongest materials of carbon, carbon bond. Carbon fiber is extremely strong. But in order to get there, you have to take a precursor and burn away half its, half its raw material content. So that would be one thing that you'd need to do to get the cost down. Another thing you need to do is speed the process up. Uh, fiber manufacturing is an interesting science. Uh, I spent most of my professional career as the president of the fibers division of Allied Signal. And making sure that you could run those fiber lines as fast, as efficiently as possible was always a challenge. But you could speed the process up. If you were able to do that and you could significantly reduce the cost of carbon fiber today, you could then to go after the higher, the higher volume applications. Look, look, looking at Tom's curve and moving up the volume side, get up to automotive. And so probably today, most of the glam tech, <laughs> most of the interest in carbon fiber is around finding a recipe for making it cheap enough so that it can go into automotive applications. And what I find interesting is that the leading companies uh, in the world who are looking at automotive applications are German car companies. 
So something about the value in Germany of a pound saved in a vehicle, particularly an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle, uh, is a little bit better than it is other places in the world. In fact, that was one of the students in this class did a, his paper on the BMW i3, which is a carbon fiber shell, all electric vehicle. Now that vehicle cost, I think what he did, and I don't know what it costs today, but it was about a $40,000 Mini. Okay, I mean, mm -hmm. when I say Mini, like a, you know, uh, the, the size of the vehicle is such as uh, the Cooper Mini, okay? It's a small car. But it turns out the way they were able to do that, because carbon fibers are kind of expensive, as Dave said, and you still got this $2 a pound savings, is you actually had knock-on savings. When you went to the carbon fiber, you got lighter, but you could have a smaller battery, which made you lighter, which in the knock-on from things. And not in, not in the added manufacturing course, but if you took my structural materials course, I talk about the, the value of a pound of weight saved on a turbine disc is not $200 a pound, like it is for the structural airframe. It's $2,000 a pound on the engine and on the disc, which spins really fast, it's more like $20,000 a pound on the commercial aircraft. So if you can take a pound off one area, you can take a lot of weight off something else. And it turns out taking like 20 pounds out of the engine means lighter wings. And for the Air Force, it means $2,000 with payload, extra bombs, or extra range in terms of fuel or extra range in terms of fuel economy for the, the air, airline industry if it's commercial. You have to understand this is an old figure from the 1990s and you can probably double it or triple it, but a 50 degree Fahrenheit increase in operating te temperature of a jet engine just on straight thermodynamics of you know the efficiency of a heat engine. You took thermodynamics and you learned about delta T over T Okay, is the efficiency of the engine. Back in the 90s, that was a $2 billion of fuel savings for the airlines. Fuels were cheaper, cheaper then, okay? It's probably $6 billion to get a 50 degree temperature increase uh, in your operating temperature of jet engine. And what have they done to do that? Today, they actually cool the turbine blades. So the gas running through the engine is at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. What's the melting point of the turbine alloy? 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. If you didn't have the cooling air going through that turbine blade, your whole engine would melt in seconds. Except the cooling air is built by the compressor, which comes from the engine. So if your engine isn't running, or if your engine's running, you will have the cooling. But it's an amazing technology if you think about it to have gas going through there at 600 degrees above the melting point, melting point, and about 800 degrees above the surface temperature of the alloy that you're using. Amazing engineering. When the, when the physicists, physicists came up with the 20 greatest, greatest advances of the 20th century, which is around 2000, they came up with things like clean water. How big an effect is that around the world, right? They came up with productive agriculture, I mean, feeding people. But number 20, we just barely made it, was turbine blades, okay? Those turbine blades, that, that industry has really come a long way. And it turns out, if you go back and look, look at the history of MIT, there was a professor here in this department, Bud Shank. And he was working with Nick Grant on high temperature materials, and he left this place and he went to a place called Pratt Whitney. And he was the guy who actually in the 19, late 60s and 70s developed the materials technology for these alloys. Okay. So you actually can always, you can often go back to MIT. It wasn't MIT and Nick Grant that did the first splat ruling. It was a guy at Caltech. Oh, okay. was it? Yeah. Uh, uh, Douay? What was Duway, it? Yeah. Douay, yeah. yeah. Anyway, questions? Why are the venture capitalists here? If they've only got a three-year time horizon, 
what is their goal? Is their goal to fund additive manufacturing technology? The answer is no. Their goal is to get to the IPO. And if you've got someone like Tom Eager saying, hey, hey, your powder metallurgy technique is for additive manufacturing is a bunch of crap. They want to silence me. <laughs> Because they're not going to have a good IPO if the world learns that what they're selling when they have their IPO is a bunch of crap. But they will walk away when they have their IPO with hundreds of millions of dollars in their pocket. And your grandmothers are going to end up with pensions that are worth a lot less. Yeah. What's an IPO? Initial public offering. Okay. So if you want to talk about right now in the news is Ito and Media Lab, right? And they were selling influence. That's they were selling MIT's reputation <coughs> to Epstein. Okay, that's not right. But you know what the IPOs and the venture capitalists are doing every day around here? They're selling MIT's reputation to Wall Street and to your grandmothers for their pension funds. And some of them. There are some technologies that really work. I was on engineering council when Akamai went public. And a professor in math became a billionaire overnight. Okay? They had the technology, it was a real technology. But as Dave says, when you if you spray and pray, you don't hit those very often. Okay? Uh, and you can talk about Google and Facebook and things like that. People always like to talk about the big hitters. Okay? There are 19 failures for every success. And I'm not, not talking about the big successes. There are 19 failures for every company that's successful. And most of those are barely making it. Okay? And money talks around this place. Okay? I don't care what you say. And that's what you're hearing in the news when they talk about ETO. Did the upper administration know it? I have no idea, because I'm not involved in the upper administration anymore, but from what I knew from 20 years ago, I don't doubt it. Okay? I've seen people sell their souls. In fact, there's one that's not up here. <laughs> we could talk about molten metal technologies. Oh, yes. You want to say something about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so molten metals technology, back in the early 90s, there was a guy who was a graduate of chemical engineering, and he was hired by U.S. Steel Research. And when he went to U.S. Steel Research, he learned that liquid iron is a high temperature universal solvent. Just like water is a universal solvent at room temperature for all kinds of things, you go to high temperatures, iron will dissolve almost anything. And so he had this great idea when he was at U.S. Steel, he was going to take the steel furnace and throw all the environmental crap into the furnace to get rid of the environmental waste. Okay? Pretty good idea. Takes it to U.S. Steel, and U.S. Steel knows something about steel technology and how to melt steel. And they looked at his idea and they said, no, we don't want to patent it. He says, well, why not? He said, well, we just don't want to do it. Because they were metallurgists and they understood the steel making technology. If you throw crap in your steel pot, you're going to end up with crap steel out. Okay? And you won't be able to make steel. And the people at US Steel thought they wanted to stay in the steel business rather than just make big paperweights. Okay? And so he bought the technology, or he got the rights. And he came back to MIT. And he got together with a guy named John Preston, who was pre head of the MIT Industrial. Uh, well, no, not with ILP. He was head of the technology licensing office. And the two of them started a company called Molten Metals Technology. And this became one of the darlings of Wall Street. Overnight, the two of them were worth $30 million apiece. Okay? They hadn't even built a plant. They got some venture capital money. They uh, built an induction melting facility down in Fall River, Massachusetts. And they could melt 2,000 pound heats of steel and throw crap in there, and it would all burn up. And you know what you could do with the steel afterwards? You could make big paperweights that would rust over time. Okay? 
They got so brazen that they claimed, they told the Department of Energy they could take radioactive waste and they could make it non-radioactive by throwing it in steel. How many of you believe that? Wall Street Journal believed it. It was on the front page. Okay. Really? Okay. Don Sadaway and I were just sitting there shaking our heads saying, they don't understand. A lot of your waste has the elements of chlorine in your, you know, in your waste. Another element is sodium. You know what chlorine does in the steel bath? It combines with the carbon in the steel and the oxygen to form this, COCl2. You know what that's called? Phosgene. <laughs> Everybody knows phosgene. It was a phosgene. chemical weapon in World War One, And you just had it pouring out of the furnace. Okay? What a great idea, guys. How'd you like to work in that plant? Okay? You know what happens when you add sodium to a steel, molten steel bath? The refractory walls that keep the whole furnace from melting down turn liquid. Because sodium lit lowers the last melting point of the refractories. So first some sodium in. Instead of relining the furnace every three or four years, we can reline it every week. Okay? What a great idea! Now do you know why U.S. Steel thought the guy was an idiot? And they were happy when he quit. <laughs> and he was happy when he was worth thirty million dollars a couple of months later. And Sadaway and I were just sitting there. Oh. And so what happens? Al Gore, vice president of the United States, running for president in the 1990s. So he's going to come. He, he was the technology leader, right? He invented the internet. He invented the internet, or at least he signed the bill. Okay. Um, and he came. He was going to come to MIT as part of this campaign and go over to Kresge, and they're going to have a technology roundtable. Who's in charge of the technology roundtable? Putting it together. John Preston, the head of MIT's Technology Licensing Office. Would you consider it a conflict for one of the four companies that he puts on there is to be molten metal, something that he owns 30% of? Sadaway and I thought it was a conflict. We wrote to the vice president of research at MIT and said, we think this is a conflict. He said, don't worry about it. Oh, OK, fine. I won't worry about it. So you don't think money talks in the upper administration? OK? No one else there even knew that Preston was putting his company forward as part of his job at MIT with the Vice President of the United States, okay, out of him. Anyway, but those, those types of things happen, folks, okay, and they're going to happen to you. You're going to graduate, you're going to be in some of these positions, and you've got to make a decision now. Are you going to go along with the crowd? Are you going to be willing to resign? and go get another job. I've been working two jobs since I was 19 years old. That's 80 to 100 hours a week. Now, I don't work that much anymore. I'm down to about 70 hours a week. But when I ran afoul of the MIT administration, I had another job, folks. They tried to push me out of here because I knew the dirt. And I would keep my mouth shut as department head they were very happy when I decided to step down, and I decided to step down and keep my mouth shut as long as they don't bother me. But if they bother me, I know where the dirt is. Okay? So we have a sort of an agreement. They leave me alone, I leave them alone. Okay? But I don't mind telling you the story, and it'll be on YouTube tomorrow. Okay? Anybody wants to watch it, but there's not a million people watching. Yeah. Is molten metal still operating? Or oh, it no, they got indicted. Okay. And fortunately, <laughs> MIT's name was not associated. When I read it in the Globe, the first thing I looked at that article, I scanned it quickly to see if those letters of MIT were in there. Fortunately, MIT was no longer associated with it. But some of the faculty in this department were sitting on their scientific advisory board and making, you know, getting these big fees and going around touting this technology. 
hey, you can get rid of the transuranic elements by just throwing them in the seal bath. Oh, well, great. Do you believe that? Okay. But there were people, faculty, who were getting paid tens of thousands of dollars to not come forward and say, as you know, a scientific advisory board member, they could have come forward and said, no, guys, I think you're overstepping your bounds. But none of them did. Okay? But eventually, the Justice Department did type uh, Chris, I can't remember what his name was, mayor. First name of the guy who did this, and then John Preston, I think they were. He, 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 uh, he had to resign from the technology licensing office. And MIT did distance themselves, just like MIT is distancing itself from NITO right now. Okay? But it's not, a, it's not a pretty story, okay? Additive manufacturing, which is what we're supposed to be talking about, is a viable technology, but you should know by now that it's only in the aerospace and space sectors. You're not going to start building automobiles out of it. And when next week, if you read the, uh, I, it's not in the, uh, the 11 little things from digital alloys, but in desktop metals, there's an article that I will go through where they came up. Have I told you about the eyeglass hinges? Two years and $200 million worth of research, and the best thing they can come up with is they can make 45,000 eyeglass hinges in a four hour shift. That's what the revolution work. We'll talk about the fallacies of the eyeglass hinges. We will have a surface roughness like this. And they're going to tell you, oh, we can put three parts together and turn it into one part. The hinge pin, and, you know. And it talks in the article about how many people have ever had problems with thin, the screw coming loose, okay? Yeah, yeah. It talks about you won't have that problem anymore. It'll all be integrated together. Yeah, it'll have a surface roughness like this. What do you think the wear properties of that hinge pin are going to be? Now you understand why I say some of this is crap, okay? It doesn't take very much critical thinking to realize people are just in this for the money. And they're willing to steal your grandmother's pension. Yeah? Oh, well, it's in other manufacturing, so like expensive or energy intensive? Like, is it because it's like a... Because you're laying down one layer at a time. Okay, if you watch my casting lectures, I actually did a calculation, this was eight years ago, of how fast they, people were big on vapor depositing and stuff. The maximum growth rate by vapor depositing metal is something on the order of a millimeter per minute. Okay, you can go through the kinetic theory of gases. How fast can atoms hit the surface? Okay? And it's less than, a, it's about a half a millimeter a minute. You know how fast you can pour metal into a mold and build up something that's how many millimeters thick? So just, I, this is to show that I was trying to demonstrate the casting. And I calculated it had a somewhere between 100,000 and a million fold speed advantage. Okay, you talked about speed, okay? Casting a metal is 100,000 or a million times faster than vapor depositing a metal, okay? And added manufacturing is, okay, I'm going to start with three micron powders rather than pouring a big lump into a mold, okay? Now, you can't always go with the casting. You have to do some other things to it. But even so, when you start off with 100,000 or a million fold productivity advantage, people got to go a long way. And that machine that will make those 45,000 uh, eyeglass hinges in an hour, or in four hours, it's a million dollar machine. And the current machine to make, well, we'll talk about eyeglass hinges uh, in the next class. But the current machine is a wire drawing machine that can process that material in five minutes, as opposed to. Uh, the, the first time they ever tried to make a disc by additive manufacturing was 1975. Pratt and Whitney had this 75 kilowatt laser, it was sort of a researchy thing. It was sort of it was in the public domain, but you couldn't really buy one. And the U.S. Navy gave him a big contract to make a six-inch turbine disc. It took him a month to grow it. That's fast, right? 
Anyway, okay. Do you have anything else, Dave? No, I really don't. You don't have any questions? In the class, thanks for coming, Dave. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.